My biggest successes have been building great teams, finding great leaders, exciting those leaders to do things that are beyond what they thought they could do. In the beginning, I was more, if I had to think about it, more of a micromanager. I had to do everything myself. And then as I, my responsibilities grew, I couldn't do everything myself. So, and, and I eventually got to be a good delegator and a good truster of teams. That's when I knew I had to have great people because I couldn't do it all myself. Uh, I learned that I learned so much from others that I got smarter from getting better people around me, doing great things, and I could take from them their knowledge and information, and we got better and better and better. My style changed from micromanager to trust and delegator. I think it just happened. I'd like to think that I, I knew I was too impatient. I knew I was a micromanager. And both of those things came about when you hire great people. You can't be an impatient jerk. They won't let you, you, you won't have them. So you, you learn from, from these experiences. You can't be a micromanager when you've got 400,000 people. You can't micromanage. So these things evolve. Everything's an evolution. I kept hiring more and more people, but when I say uh, building a team, you're still the captain of the team. So you don't give up the vision, the values of the company, where you're going, how you're gonna get there. So the broad strategy is still you. They then take the broad strategy and make it much bigger and better than it was under some umbrella. Like for example, I wanna be number one or number two in every business we're in. I wanna be the most competitive enterprise on earth. Okay, what does that mean? It means something to that business. It means something to that business. So that leader will take that broad brush and make it their own, they'll own it. And they'll define it their way. So it's, a, it's an evolution, everything, is, is sort of evolving all the time. Getting, it's an iteration, it's better, it's better. You learn, then of course, once you get 15 great direct reports or 20, you take the best of each and you transfer it across. Transferring the best ideas from one business to another, from one person to another, they then multiply because they, they learn from the other 14. And so everything keeps, the boat keeps going up. Making mistakes is part of the game. And I would, look, I made more than anybody. So I would always use mistakes in the classroom at Crotonville where I taught the students once a month, where I taught our young managers. I would use my mistakes as, as an example. If I can screw this up, you want to be taking bigger chances, okay? Teaching people to take risks and, and, and make mistakes is an important part of leadership. I played hockey till I was 50. I wanted to be a professional hockey player. Uh, that was my dream. I was very good at high school. I was very good at every sport when I was young. I was probably the best 12-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old baseball player best pitcher. I was a terrific hockey player. I was a pretty good golfer. The problem was, the only good thing I ever got better in was golf, because my legs never got any longer. <laughs> I never got fast enough. My, my fastball was great when I was 14. When I was 16, it looked like a softball coming to people, because other 16-year-olds were much better. It happened in every sport, I, but I was lucky. I realized I wasn't good enough. Look, I think the lucky break I had in Colorado was I always loved teams, playing on teams, being in sports. I loved hanging around with people, you know, so I was always there. And it's a natural thing for me. I mean, I think business is a game. I haven't changed a bit in many ways from the teams before to the teams now. I learned much of what I learned about business from those teams. 
When I was young, and I was playing baseball, and I was playing with the older boys, you would go to the playground, and they would pick teams, one team and another team. Uh, they would throw the bat up, and you'd go like this with the bat, and the person who puts the hand on top gets first pick. So for the captain, and he was always the older kid, so I was the little kid, the older kid, would pick the team, and he'd pick a pitcher. The best player would be the pitcher. The second best player would be the shortstop. And then the last player picked, and it was often the youngest kids, and would go to right field, way out in right field, okay? And not very much. That's differentiation. That is what we, you practice in business. You take the best, you, you reward them, take care of them, and the weakest. All these things are simple things. They're not big, sophisticated. They're from the playground. I mean, it, business is a game. The team with the best players wins. I think fair is important. For example, when you take somebody out of a job, you gotta be sure you are doing it right. You're treating them right. Uh, you've evaluated that they, uh, they should be the one to go. All these, fair is a very important part of business. You can't be perceived in any way as playing favorites. As, you gotta try Now, one of the problems of being a, uh, a leader and a CEO, you weren't trained to be a judge. And you are often making the umpire's call, the referee's call. And you, you weren't trained to do that. You have to, fair though is a very important part of being a good business leader. And, and it's not, it's, you got to try and make it as black and white as you can. I don't think people know that in business, to be good, you've got to be fair. For example, in negotiations, you want to leave something on the table so the person you negotiated with goes home feeling well. It's not a victory if you take all the spoils and they're mad at you and they don't trust you, and they won't do business with you again. So fair is a very important word. I'm glad you brought it up because it is an important thing for every young business leader to think about. But I believe deeply in that word. The most self-confident people are simple. To, but to be simple is hard. Anybody can write a 20-page paper Try writing two paragraphs, getting your message across. But you use the word informal. Making a company informal is a big deal, a big company. I mean, I, and, I, and I, I don't mean no tie, I don't mean the Friday afternoon the casual, I, I mean culturally. I mean everybody's first name. Everybody's able to talk to everybody, there's no, floor that's isolated, as though nobody's above talking to the lowest person in the place. Anybody with an idea that's good can surface it. And that takes a lot of, a lot of, like we put a, pr a process called workout, which I s described in my first book in great detail, where we had hundreds of employees would, would come into a meeting. The CEO of the business would, would come in, and maybe they'd have 120 people. CEO would come in, the CEO would say, here's where we're going, here's what we're doing. I'd like your best ideas about everything. Your own job, the company's job. CEO would have a facilitator there. In those days, a professor from a business school would be sitting there with him. And the CEO would leave, come back 24 hours later. We had easels with uh, writings on them and they will have come up with 50 ideas. The rules were the CEO had, had to say yes or no to 75% of them. And within 30 days, had to have 25, the last 25% answers. So the employees learned one thing from that. We gave them voice and dignity. And voice and dignity to every employee is critical so that they don't have to wait for a hierarchy there. These people might have been, I remember sitting once in a meeting where the 
Union Stewart in Louisville was, uh, an engineer was up describing a paint line. You know, the, the, the doors of the refrigerator would go up around the building and be spray painted and covered with this and everything. And the engineer was, had a suggestion. And he was describing what he'd like to do. And the, the union guy got up and said, that's bullshit. He said, let me, let me show you how that really works up there. And he, and he showed the whole thing. That gave him voice in that meeting. It was an out, because I went to the final day when they were telling what the ideas were. I went just to sit in on it. And he got up and he just, that guy never would have spoken before. We gave them voice. So everybody felt they had a, a role in the company. No one, and the guy said at the end of the meeting, he used a great line, I'll never forget as long as I live. He said, hey Jack, you've been paying me for 25 years to get my hands and my legs. You could have had my brain for nothing. You never asked. You cannot make a head decision without a heart involved. There's no, there, there's, there's no question. You'd like to be able to clearly draw a line, but you can't because you're an emotional human being. You, to think you could isolate your heart or your head is impossible. Now, balancing that's tricky. Sometimes your heart gets in the way and you don't make the best decision. Sometimes your head jumps in too analytically and you don't think of the consequences. So, but you're always trying to balance that. It's, it's, it's the challenge. It's the challenge of eat and dream, short range, long range. Business is a bunch of paradoxes. Short, long, hot, head, and you try and do your best, and you don't always get it right. Intuition and gut to me, it's at least 75% of the game. And when you're in a job like I had a CEO with thousands and thousands of people, with everyone wanting something, every deal you look at has got a perfect return. Otherwise, they wouldn't bring it to you. It's 100% have a DCRR of 25% or return on investment. So every deal you're going to look at, no one brings in a bad deal. They wouldn't show up. So in order to say yes or no, it's got, because the numbers are all going to be perfect. I had 10 to 12 real close buddies. And well, we always said we were running the family grocery store. You know, and what, what happens in the family grocery store? You want to be that family grocery store. You know your, every employee. You know when they're sick, when their mother's sick, when, when their kids can't get enough money for school. You know everything. You know your customers. Mrs. Jones just didn't show up this morning. What, she thinks something's wrong. She always gets her milk at this time. But you know everything. And that's what you'd love a big company to be, a corner grocery store. Have feelings for the people, soul, know them, be about them. No, you fight every day to get there. You never get there. But that is the goal, the family grocery store. And you and your friends are running the grocery store. And so you're talking like grocery store owners. How is the customer? How is the customer doing? How are they... Employee engagement, how, how good is it? Well, employee engagement's a big word. What it is is how involved are your people in the mission of the company? Do they have a purpose? Have you given them purpose? Have you given them a direction, a way to go? Well, I had many difficult ups and downs. Uh, knocked off the horse, I like to say. It's how well you get back on the horse after you, the horse throws you. Early on in my career, I blew up a factory. And I was only in the company 18 months. And my boss, I was a chemical engineer, I was running a little pilot plant, and I blew the roof off the building. No one got killed, thank God. And my boss didn't know me anymore. So he sent me to New York to meet his boss's boss to explain what had happened. He thought I was gonna get booted so I went down to see this boss, and this boss told me, couldn't have been nicer. 
took me through the Socratic method. Do you know why it happened? Do you know how to fix it? How will you fix it? Instead of beating me up, I thought I was going to get fired. You know, I thought I was gone. And uh, instead, I got to know him very well. And in the end, he was very helpful to my career from this disaster. Uh, so that was one. I also, when I was CEO, I bought an investment bank called Kidder Peabody. I was, I was getting too full of myself. You know, I was buying everything. And they were all working. So I bought an investment bank. The numbers looked good. We were in GE Capital. We had lots of fees we were paying to investment banks. But we had a culture of sharing ideas, of building employees. Investment banks have a culture of my bonus, my bonus, my bonus. And it didn't work at all. We had disasters. And the Wall Street Journal pummeled us every 18 out of 24 months, we were on the front page as being stupid for buying it, okay? In some way. Now, we, got, we sold it, we got out, we made money. But you'll never make up for the pain you went through for buying it. What was wrong there? The numbers worked, but the culture didn't fit. So I learned culture counts. And I understood more about when you make an acquisition or you make an arrangement, you've got to have the culture right. If the culture's not right, you don't have it. And so each one of those things were painful, ugly, awful, and you had to look in the mirror every day to get your self-confidence back. I mean, you, self-doubt creeps in. There's no question. Every one of us has self-doubt. We all look like we're full of confidence. But self-doubt is always lingering. So I've always had a healthy paranoia that this thing was going to end. This dream was going to end, you know, and you got to wrestle yourself back up again. And my mother always, you know, was right there with me. I always told everybody, you got to eat while you dream. Eat while you dream. And so don't tell me about you can fix this 10 years from now. How are we going to eat today? So you got to eat and you got to dream. Anybody can eat, squeeze, get it done tomorrow. Anybody can say, come back in five years. I'll, I'll let you know how it worked out. No, you got to eat and dream. And, and, and if you just use those two words, and we use them every day, all day, that was eat and dream. And you can't do one and not do the other, or you won't have a long-term company. But you can't just dream, because you won't have tomorrow's shareholders will throw you out. First thing I would tell CEOs in succession is you never know, never really know what that person is going to be like when they have the job. Uh, let, let me explain what I mean by that. When you were born, you are tied to your mother. And your mother takes you through, or your father takes you through. You go to school, your teacher is your boss. Your teacher is grading you, evaluating you, doing things to you. You go to college, your professor's doing the same thing. You go to work, and you work for some manager. So you're always trying to manage your manager. You haven't really said who you are yet in all these places. You become CEO, it's you. You go for the first time in your life unsupervised. So everything about you is you. Deep-seated prejudices you had, biases you had, feelings you had, behaviors you had that were suppressed are all out there. You'll never know what those things are. You, what you want to do is try and find out who the person really is, as best you can. And recognize it's the most brutal job to find out you'll ever have. So you test them in different environments. You try them remotely. You try them in close. We're, we're working in the same building. You try them, we're, we're working in another, in Angola. Okay, you try them there. 
How many times can you read these people in different settings? High growth, then low cost. Get, 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 get them in one of your toughest grinding businesses. Get them in a the high growth where everything looks good all the time. Try every situation you can get them to to try and find out who that person really is. Now recognize you're on a mission that's probably the most impossible mission that ever existed. Who you've hired and what have they gone on to do? Tell me about your hires, the people you selected. Where did they go? What did they do? Did they leave the company? Did they grow into a something else? How many successes have you had? How many people are now in jobs that are better than the job you have? I always ask this question, tell me about your last job, talk about it. If they start telling you their last boss was a jerk, a jackass, guess what? Six months from now, you'll be that person. You'll be the jerk, you'll be the jackass. I had a, 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 a brilliant Irish mother who who never went beyond the eighth grade, uh, who did all the taxes for everybody in the neighborhood, who was terribly smart, uh, but didn't have any of the advantages or anything in life. And, um, and she, she, she was in her 40s. And uh, her family had all died from heart disease. Uh, she had her heart attack, uh, her first heart attack, the same year I had my heart attack. Not the same year, the same age uh, and her and she had it with what her parents had had it and so now she didn't have bypass technology that I had so I was lucky but so she was always prepared to die and I was an only child and so she would send me to Boston by myself which was a big deal on the train by myself uh, she was always pushing me out into situations. Go out there, and if there was gonna be a fight, a street fight, she said, get out there and defend yourself. And I'd be out in the street fighting. And it was just the opposite of protection. And uh, some of the kids had big brothers, like five and six brothers, and I was the only child. And she'd say, you, you get yourself, and she'd kick me on the butt, get out there and take him on. You know, you have to have a, because in, in my na our neighborhood, you'd have a fight, you'd have to, the teams would form and you'd go in the, and you'd fight. And, uh, and you can't be a wimp about this, Jack, you gotta go take it. Sometimes I get a bloody nose, and black eye or whatever, and she'd get out there. You know, she was always preparing for her death. It was wild. But so I was mature beyond my years. Caddying, I recommend to every kid because you learn who's a jerk, how jerks behave, how good people behave. You learn tipping, you learn generosity, which is a very important part of leadership. Uh, you, you learn all kinds of adult behaviors. You watch them. And you see what you like and don't like. And you see people behaving in private again. Some people cheat. You see all those things. So it's a, an incredible experience for a 12-year-old kid to be caddying. This MBA thing is the most exciting thing I've ever done because we're transforming an educational experience. In our school, we take middle managers, beginning managers, some not managers yet, average age is 35, and we teach them how to hire, fire, motivate, build. We teach them heart, head. We teach them short range, long range, eat, dream. We teach all these practical things about how to win. Now, we don't promise you if you come to our school, a job in, a, in another company. We have no placement office. We teach you things to grow in your company. We're a vertical, not a horizontal 
school. Now, if you want to take the degree and go out and get yourself a job, fine. But in order to get in, you must have a job. You must have at least five years of operating experience. You know, and it's, it's taking leaders and online while they work, while they're working, learn it on Monday, practice it on Tuesday, share the experience with their classmates of the success on Friday. So it's real live training, if you will. And 75% of our people are getting double digit raises or promotions while they're in school. And the unique thing about this school is the students are the customer, not the faculty. Education today, it's all about the hierarchy, the faculty, etc. We put the hands of the students. Our net promoter score is 77. Better than Amazon, better than Apple. Our students are that satisfied because they determine they're spending their money, they determine if they're learning. If they're not, we take the professors out. They don't go to the next semester. So it's a, it's a, we're taking business principles and applying them to education. It's exciting as can be. Building this school, making this school a great school, changing the educational model so that everybody, it's affordable. You get an MBA for $39,000 and you keep working. If you drop, drop out of school and go get an MBA, you lose your salary, $100,000 a year. That's 200, costs you 100 more to go there. It's $300,000, puts you in debt, puts you behind the eight ball. So if you got rich parents, the traditional school is still wonderful. If you got a rich aunt, great. But for kids that are fighting their way to better lives and better improvements, we give it to them. I'm confident in this country. The young people are entrepreneurial. There's no country in the world that gives everybody a chance like we do. If you think of the biggest advantage of America, it's the match of intellect and money. Other countries have intellect and they don't match it with the money. So anybody with an idea here can make it happen. Look at it, it happens every day. How many businesses we start every day how many businesses we close every day? We start and close, you know, thousands. I think that every one of us who's out there should take what they like about each person to choose and put together who they want to be and what they want to be and what they can learn from each one. <laughs>